It's time for Cutting Edge Consciousness with Freeman Michaels and Barnett Bain. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here with Barnett Bain. I hope that you've all um, had a beautiful and connected and grounded and integrated and a loving and uh, if uh, any of you out there were experienced any triggering kind of moments over the holidays, I know <laughs> it's, I know uh, that tends to a happen. I triggering. hope that you handled it with grace and a plum, <laughs> plum. <laughs> and a partridge in a pear tree. Oh uh, yes. How about you, uh, Freeman? I know you were out of town. Yeah, it was it was a little rough this year. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know that my brother's going through divorce. Yes. And uh, my Uncle Jim went through a divorce this last year. Yes, I know that your family has a group break going. Well, this, uh, this is what happened. On group on. I had a cousin announce a couple weeks ago that he and his wife are splitting up. Um, when I was 16, my Aunt Vicky got in a car crash, and she passed away. And we had a funeral, and we all cried. And then that Christmas, uh, which happened a few months after, we set a place for her at the table. And there was a kind of reverence for her loss. And then about a year later, my, uh, one of my uncles divorced his wife of many, many years. Um, and there was no ceremony. There was no funeral. There was no place set at the table. And, um, and I felt that Christmas, like something was wrong. Like something was, like there was something that no one was talking about. And that, that came rushing back this Christmas. I felt like, you know, um, everyone's chatting as if we're okay, and, and something's really not okay. And there's no closure. No, and no reverence no for the loss, the loss of a, a family member, you know? I was telling Isabella, my seven-year-old, because uh, we had to tell the kids uh, about, you know, that Auntie Anne Marie won't be there this Christmas. Um, and she said, well, when do I get to see her? <sighs> brutal it's just brutal you know mm -hmm. um and of course all of this is happening uh against the backdrop of uh the most perfect dickensian christmas ever <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh giant fluffy snowflakes uh, yeah. tumbling by the window and the christmas adorned and yeah um every every holiday hook imaginable yeah running through our s collective psyches yeah so it's um it's a challenge it is it's huge it's a challenge because it, it's it's almost an invocation it's almost an invitation for all of these uh thoughts and feelings and emotions that um, um are stealth or have yeah. been outright denied that are bubbling below the surface and to come on up and there's no real again there's no real um, structure to hold this. I mean, my my um, uh, niece and nephew, uh, they've been going through mediation and there's counseling and there's been a lot of conversations and I felt, I feel like they're making sense of it, but there's no, the, the collateral damage, you know, of, of a divorce. All the cousins, all the nieces and nephews, all the other, you know, it's not, it, it's incomplete, you know, and there's these fractures that um, are, are they, I, obviously every family has this, but, um, you know, this year it was, it was ripe in my family. So it was really, it was curious. In fact, on Christmas, after Christmas dinner, my jazz and I got a chance to take a little walk and we walked for about 50, 50 minutes and I needed it. I needed to talk. I needed to just get out and get some air. I, I could feel like I couldn't breathe in there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not at the place where I'm blaming. I'm not saying someone ought to do something different. I mean, I'm an adult, I'm responsible. I, I don't know how to handle this, you know. I, I, I don't know uh, exactly what 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 to do to help not just the kids but the adults to make sense of this. I'm going to call it a death because it feels like a death. Sure. You know, my my aunt who when I was going I was I was bringing up my aunt from many years ago that when 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 um, they divorced, I didn't see her for 20 years. I mean, finally at my grandfather's funeral, I saw this aunt who I was very close to growing up. She just suddenly was gone, you know? Well, I uh, feel a whole uh, freight train of, um, of denied or repressed feelings uh, and 
coupled up to uh, two, three miles long of baggage cars filled <laughs> with secrets <laughs> rumbling through some tunnel. So before it kind of blasts out, I think it would be a, a, a very good time indeed mm. to uh, introduce um, our guest, my friend Ken Druck. Uh, Dr. Ken uh, has uh, he's many things since, since founding the Jenna Druck Center uh, in 1996. Uh, Ken has become a uh, lifeline for thousands of families who've suffered a loss. He's um, often called upon to assist in healing after um, such tragic events as 9-11 and Columbine, Hurricane Katrina, and um, most recently the Newtown tragedy. He's the author of The Secrets Men Keep, Breaking the Silence Barrier and Healing Your Life After the Loss of a Loved One. And I'm also uh, have in front of me his latest book, The Real Rules of Life, Balancing Life's Terms with Your Own. And it is uh, 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 a treasure. The book is a treasure. So, Ken, uh, I'm very grateful to have you here with us on Cutting it's Edge It's so conscious. good to be with both of you. Mm. Well, you've, um, you have a sense of the lay of the land, my friend. Um, yeah, I do. What do you, what, what Sometimes we wish we didn't. But um, we create a, 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 this beautiful Christmas blueprint, as uh, both of you were discussing, and then life speaks, life weighs in, and Connecticut happens, and uh, divorces, and um, not only so not only life losses, but living losses like divorces and illnesses, and uh, and we get to learn how to live in the in the realm of all of it don't we mm. and there's even something it's almost like a survivor's guilt or a symbiotic guilt where things are going so beautifully sometimes and you you look around and there is hardship and there's adversity there are challenges and there's tragedy and in my own experience there can be um a siren call an invitation to begin um spiraling down the emotional tube, uh, so that's a that's a, a a factor there as well. Holidays are a very very challenging time for so many reasons. Lots of invitations to all of us, and I think you guys said it best. How do we hold all of it? Mm. Since um, since pain and suffering seem to be a part of the the package deal of life, <laughs> and since also these beautiful miracles of our seven-year-old kids and uh, the beauty of, of what's outside, nature, and, and the, be- the love of, of uh, those close to us that we're so grateful for. Since all of it's part of the package deal, how do we hold it all somehow? And, and, and I, think, I think the appropriate response, at least for me, is um, I don't know. And, and, you know, we've talked about this before on this show, Ken, where... I don't know is not a complacency. It's an offer to um, discover and be discovered by something yet unknown, uh, a way of being with the experience that allows it. And for me, I would say in a new way, because again, I can kind of point to the modeling, uh, the coping strategies from my, my family of origin. And I know that for my life, they're insufficient. You know, um, one of the most insidious is, is the storytelling where there's a story that gets generated about, you know, what, what the reason for the divorce. You know, some, oh, I, I, you know, some... De- de- no, some demonizing of whoever it is that, well, they got divorced because she's like this or he did that or whatever, which undermines, you know, the complexity and disallows uh, other feelings, the complexity of feelings to come up, where there's lots of different emotions that are all sort of weaving in and out. And, uh, and so I'll say out loud that I don't know entirely how I want to respond to all of this, other than, you know, to say this is tricky and, and it's hard. I, I love what you're saying, uh, the, the humility and the truth that resonates when we allow ourselves to say, you know what, I'm on my knees. Mm. I really just don't know. Everything in my basic training as a man, you know, has taught me to control and to connect all the dots to figure out and fix everything and uh, to do it quickly. Yeah. That's, that's a measure of, you know, how competent. 
confident I am as an adult and as a man. And yet, understanding our own feeling of helplessness at mm. times, our own sense of unknowingness, the humility with which we hold that, and, and moments that uh, are choiceless. And I know that's a controversial word, choicelessness, um, especially in an era where we want to make everything a choice. Hey, it's your choice to have a great day. You know what? Sometimes it isn't a choice we have. Sometimes it's a lousy day. It, the day sucks, and we're sitting in the middle of you know the ashes of Plan A <laughs> and looking at it, Plan B or C or D or whatever's next, and we just don't know what to do. Well, there is this um, this um, conditioned cultural conditioning um, that says we should buck up, uh, we should straighten out, we should fly right, and we should uh, man up over our feelings, and uh, that I think is systemic. It's women are a little less constricted, but not by much. Uh, they get to um, cry quietly so that it doesn't offend anybody or it doesn't um, tweak anybody out. We have these very, very limited prescriptions um, for handling our feelings. And then they seem to um, stack up um, outrage upon outrage upon outrage. The one that I hear uh, over the radio over the last few days that um, triggers me where is this thing about, well, we'll move past it and we will, um, we'll find the silver linings. Um, you know, finally now there can be change. I hear this around the Connecticut uh, tragedy. Um, in Freeman, uh, in the case of your family divorces, you know, there's the story that, well, we'll move on and things will be better for, um, for brother, for daddy, for son. And this, um, it occurs to me as the the most insidious kind of violence that mm. minimizes, trivializes, anesthetizes um, what is happening on the part of the speaker and makes invisible um, what is going on for the, the person at the, uh, uh, at the effect of all of this. It also perpetuates the vicious cycle. Unprocessed grief becomes indifference to the pain of other people. Unprocessed grief somehow dulls us. It dumbs us down. It says, get on with things, and yet it disallowing that part of our humanity also cuts us off from any really viable, vibrant conversation or viable solution. You know, I'll, 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 uh, that's so brilliant what you're saying, the idea that it dumbs us down. Um, there's also this powder keg effect where, you know, um, I, I'm working, the, I've been working at being more trustworthy to myself and others. It's sort of a statement that I want to be more trustworthy. And, and being emotional is trustworthy. It, th that's the opposite of what I was taught uh, growing up. I was taught that, you know, as men, we really, as Barnett was sort of saying, have to have it tucked in and we don't get to show emotion. The challenge, of course, is when it d did come out, it was it was an avalanche of emotion, right? There was this overwhelm, and it was overwhelming because we never saw the males in my family have emotion. So when they did, at least as children, it was like, whoa, what is that? Um, you know, so there's there's sort of two parts of this. One part is where there's a sort of emotional dumbness uh, um, in, in the in the in the males within my family of origin. Um, but also this kind of scary element where they're not totally trustworthy because there's this lack of integration. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. It's, it's the, you know, in the, in the real rules of life, we talk about these kinds of blind spots and how, you know, we just, we miss out on ourselves. We've, we're so convinced that we'll be demoted, our status will be demoted on the male scale to a lesser of a man status, mm. um, that, that, that our status insecurity, which is a wonderful concept that Mike Friedman, who write, wrote the book Type A Behavior, he talked about status insecurity and how plagued are we by status insecurity that we're going to somehow be demoted and thought less of. And yet the most critical element for success in any 
of our relationships, whether we're leading a country, leading a business, or trying to function as parents or function in a relationship, an intimate relationship, or be a best friend, is our capacity to be transparent, to be emotionally honest, and that's what makes us trustworthy. So when we talk about <laughs> trustworthy, uh, it's kind of a Rorschach test. Um, it means so many things to many people. Are you referring to uh, uh, knowing and being uh, self-respecting of one's own feelings? Uh, are you referring to understanding your, uh, our, our basic uh, patterns, behaviors, our basic responses? Um, becoming intimate enough with the self so that um, it doesn't um, express um, unconsciously is, uh, are those all components and are there any more that you could that you could point to yeah I mean for me it's 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 growing up hmm. it's growing growing up spiritually emotionally interpersonally and it's putting my house in order so that I'm not running around projecting onto other people I'm not running around, that I have the sense, I'm growing and nurturing a sense of security within myself, that I can hear, I can really listen to you. I can really hear the fee, any feedback. My ins, I'm not so riddled with my own insecurities or unconsciously run by them that I can't hear what you might have to say to me. I, mean, yeah. I can't learn from you. It, there's a call. Can't self-correct. We're, we're going to... Um we're going to have to step away for a moment and pay a couple of bills. Uh, when we come back, I'd like to uh, follow up a little bit on the listening component that you alluded to. Um, so please uh, stay with us, everyone. We will be right back with Ken Druck after these words. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness, thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here with Barnett Bain and our guest, Ken Druck. Uh, before we left for break, Barnett, you were bringing up um, a quality of presence, a kind of, of listening, um, both internal listening to ourselves and then being able to really be available and listening to other people. And I, we were sort of talking about it in the context of uh, being trustworthy. And I want to pick up there. Um. Well, Ken, had, uh, you had mentioned uh, listening as a, as a function of trustworthiness. And what occurred to me um, powerfully was an experience that I had uh, the day after Christmas. I was out with a, um, a dear friend. And uh, f uh, f out of the box, um, I realized that um, she is a, I am more aware of her as a dear friend now than I was at the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> uh, or I certainly, tr I certainly am, 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 am better equipped to treat her as the dear friend that I know she is. Uh, she began to share with me some of what was going on in her life, and I immediately uh, began to judge it you know, and to take a position about it and to, mm. uh, and to give her um, unsolicited input that was um, uh, un w it wasn't that it, it wasn't by its it wasn't in the terms of its content unkind but by its nature it was unkind because it was not listening uh, I preempted I preempted her uh, emotions her thoughts her feelings I am I preempted everything about what she was sharing uh, everything of herself that she was sharing with me in order to um, uh, con have her conform to some, th to some uh, value that only I thought I knew at the moment. And uh, I could see that it wasn't going well, but that certainly didn't deter me. <laughs> And I'm sorry I'm laughing, but no, I've, done, no, it, I've done it so many times. I mean, this is we've talked about playing the expert, that this is a, a kind of tyranny. It's, it's a, a way of it is robbing really ourselves and others of intimacy. It's absolutely toxic. Anyway, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Um, I persisted, and uh, she was silent. And then a few minutes later, we moved on. And a few minutes later, she began to sob. Mm. And she said, you know, you really uh, hurt me. I felt so incredibly judged. And my first tendency is my, my first knee jerk reaction, it, the thought, fortunately, I didn't speak it, was, oh, yeah, but no, it was all this stuff. And then 
um, I dropped into a deeper knowing that I had indeed um, um, violated the relationship. There was a violence there. Uh, and so all this to set the stage for the listening conversation. Um, I, it was only in that moment that my relationship to listening dropped down or, or uh, wow. dropped down more deeply into my heart or my understanding of, uh, of listening move to another octave of experience. And so I would love to hear from you, uh, Ken, your thoughts about listening. You know, Barnett, I have a chapter in, in the book called Listening is Love. Mm. The, what we're talking about is so, and, and you guys embody it so beautifully. Uh, the joy of being on the show with you guys is the way you listen to each other, uh, the way you draw each other out, the way you invite me into the conversation, that these kind of facilitative skills, we're so used to talking over each other, we're so used to wanting to be the expert, we're so uh, at times anxious to make sure that we're being heard, that we miss out, and, and what you said was so perfect, we miss out on the connection, on the real, you know, we, we, we stay superficial. We don't really touch that point of connection, that place of meeting, that place of intimacy, and not listening is the biggest intimacy killer. So somebody once said to me that there's nothing more powerful than the feeling of being understood. Absolutely. It's a precursor for feeling loved, for feeling uh, seen, for feeling met, and that draws people out, wants them to, it makes them want to be more present, more loving, more available, more approachable. So I think whether you're a parent who is learning that the most powerful communication tool in the world is to listen. Good parents have scar tissue on their tongues, you know, <laughs> mm. um, for all those times that they just constrained said, hey, I, I need to just stay in the pocket here. Mm. I need to just stay with and be with my child, or I need to be with my husband or my wife, or I need to just be with this employee who's walked into my office and they're trying to, rather than blowing me off, they're trying to share something very difficult that's happening for them. Do I have the capacity to still all the noise in my mind and just really be there and register understanding? Yeah, and the word capacity, I mean, that's where I can personally attest to topping out often, um, where I, I, I top out. And, and there's that tendency to go, wow. I can't handle that level of discomfort, that level of not knowing. Uh, you know, what Barnett was alluding to, this playing the expert game that both he and I have gotten caught in, where, you know, it, 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 it uh, undermines the connection. It, it, it's a way of, I don't know, I think it's a way of staying safe. I think it's a way, personally, for me, um, to avoid intimacy. Yep. I didn't know that most of my life, but I'm acutely aware of it now. You know, one of the ways that I like to talk about that when it's when it's me doing that is to say to the other person, there's a very young part of me that still doesn't know how to take care of myself when you share things with me like you're sharing or when you criticize me. That's tuning out. And, and uh, first of all, I really do want to hear, but I want to own up to the fact that there's a very young, scared part of me that doesn't know how to protect myself or feels attacked and yet you're not really attacked and the other thing is to apologize after we've caught ourselves you know defending denying avoiding whatever to be able to apologize to the to the people in our lives to say you know what i just realized and i want to i owe you an apology i just realized that i have just been avoiding covering up that i really didn't listen to what you were saying and now that i've had a chance to listen I really want to thank you for not, you know, the alternative was that you just blow me off. But you really have shared something with me, and I wanted you to know I really heard you. Well, this apology piece, that's um, a big one because here comes the voice of yet another younger aspect of myself, <laughs> a little bit older, a little bit more attitude. You know, um, this uh, adolescent uh, who will be damned if he's going to apologize. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, now, that's, now, that's the shame trigger. That's the part, the humiliated aspect, right? This is the part that... 
it doesn't it, want to be it, ashamed. It, sometimes it is for yeah. sure. You know, there's a number of there's a number of uh, energies around it. Okay, uh, but suffice to say that um, that that is a very very uh, real dimension uh, uh, in all of us and me. And and he comes along too. I mean, that's he again. Comes along. We, 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 this is the idea that we hold all these parts of us. That there's a a capacity to use that language again to hold the fragmented aspects. Uh, in a way where they're present. I mean, we're present to them, but but they're not running the they're not running the show. Yeah, and owning up to them is the is the best way to harness the power of what's happening, rather than to disallow it and to stay unconscious, and to allow it to undermine you know what's happening in our relationships, with, whether it's as a parent or a partner or or whatever relationship. So, I think you know even saying. Sometimes we have to train ourselves and our partners to say, you know, right now I'm too ashamed to apologize, but what would make it safer is if I could hear from you that, you know, hey, it's safe for you. I'm not going to counterattack. I'm not going to say I told you so. You know, there are certain things that, that has, have happened in my past when I tried to apologize that shamed me for, you know, that used that information against me. And I guess if I had the assurance that it wouldn't be used against me, it would make it safer for me to really humble myself. Hmm. That is great. Hmm. Um, that is great. It's it's such a it's such a um, um, I have this image in my mind of of um, a, sm- a small self of mine crawling out from a hiding space uh, and being wooed by love hmm. to um, get back into the game, hmm. to participate and to grow. Uh, but it does take that love. And, and what I'm hearing from you, Ken, is in the first instance, of course, it takes, um, it takes personal love. It takes the love of self. I, I have to be uh, aware of these aspects of myself and loving enough to give them sufficient safety to maybe step one or two clicks out of the pattern. Yep. It's a <clears throat> it's a heightened self-awareness. I mean, you know, this idea of growing in consciousness, you know, the idea of growing, I, I think the language is even growing in capacity, the ability to hold more and more aspects of our experience, track them a little bit, not, not, not overdo it. I mean, because I think there is a, a line where we can tip into a kind of shtick. Um, you know, I'm sensitive guy. I played that for, you know, several years. Watch me be as a sensitive strategy. guy. As a strategy. Um, but, but really a, 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 a commitment, if you will, to working on you know, uh, holding these parts of us and not letting them, you know, run amok, but also picking them up in a way where uh, we, we don't go running down the path of something's wrong with me. You know, it's it's just part of my experience. I love that you use that language too, Ken. You said it's it's this younger part of me showing up, right? It's this younger aspect of me that's in play here and, and some acknowledgement of that, but not necessarily identifying or over-identifying with it. Exactly. You know, and I... For me, if you said, Ken, what's at the core of the work that you do, whether you know it, it's the coaching stuff or the, or the working with grieving families after Columbine or now helping the families after uh, this horrible tragedy in, in uh, Connecticut, it's teaching self-compassion. Mm. It's, we have more to learn about self-compassion, about kindness towards self, mm. gentleness, encouragement, and yet, when people are down, they tend to kick themselves. They, uh, they brood, like, get up, get up off the floor. You know, they're all the messaging mm-hmm. that we have, critical messaging we have for ourselves, rather than kindness, encouraging ourselves towards self-care, patience, uh, encouragement, you know, and, and, and empathy. And that all molds into a, a practice of self-compassion that I think is our greatest potential, there is greatest a, potential for self-acceptance. There is a um, sweet sorrow that is in that, that experience of compassion. It requires a, a, it requires a connection with the part that's, that's so 
um, is so damaged and, and is so uh, estranged from feeling that um, that I and this, I'll speak personally that I am worthy of love. And there's this kind of sweet <coughs> spot uh, where the sadness around that has has a sweetness, uh, and it 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 lifts. Uh, it builds uh, like a like a pilot light that starts to burn brighter and brighter and brighter. It lifts and it lifts and it lifts. I blow on it. I blow on it. Burns brighter and brighter. Uh, and, and eventually, it grows. Uh, it can grow and uh, it waxes and that flame waxes and wanes. But it can grow to a real feeling of mattering and of belonging. It doesn't necessarily happy, but it does. Um, it does feel a, a, a sense of connection that is born out of an experience of sorrow. Yeah, and there's, a, there's an authenticity to it. That, that, so one of the things that I have to, again, I kind of mentioned this before, I have to be wary of, is I, while well, everything we're talking about, this quality of presence, this way of being with these parts of me, again, I'm going to bring up the thin line. It's very easy, at least in my experience, to fall into shtick, a spoop, super spiritual guy. You know that guy, that persona I put on? Uh, not helpful. So, you know, I guess the part that uh, I have to sort of call myself on is that this humanity thing, this being human thing is a little messy. And, you know, again, going back to the many parts of me, I don't want to tuck it in into a persona, um, allowing these parts to kind of come out and let it be a little sloppy in moments is partly in my mind or in my experience, a kind of consciousness, a kind of self-acceptance that allows for me, you know, not knowing, for example, we started with that or, oh yeah, that's the part of me that wants to play the expert. I know that guy, you know, we don't want him driving the bus, but that I'm aware that he, he pops up now and again, you know, right. the, 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 the space. more spiritually evolved than thou part of me. Yeah, yeah. That's, I don't want to play that game. I mean, I have, don't get me wrong. And, and, and even he's okay, I guess. You sometimes know? you're, sometimes we're crayoning in the lines and yeah, sometimes yeah. it's over the lines. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be okay too. <laughs> and sometimes there's, it's, there's it's no this, lines at all. This propensity to want to tuck it in, you know, it loops back on itself. It's like we're back trying to tuck it in again. So I, I confess I, I do want to do a little tucking in the interests of our, um, our radio uh, and broadcast, broadcast clock. Right. Um, I know that uh, you write in uh, The Real Rules of Life. And you write on the joy muscle. You talk about putting more joy into your everyday life. And I invite you to share with uh, our listening audience uh, some of the wisdom that you have um, discovered around that topic. You know, Barnett, there, there, I, I, I've lived in a world since my own daughter's death 16 mm -hmm. years ago, um, which, in which I spent a lot of time at the bottom of pain. And I feel like I connected to understanding the suffering of the world so that when I go into places like Connecticut, uh, some of the places that after 9-11... I understand that, but what I also, what I feel like that freed me to understand is the joy mm. um, that there are precious, irreplaceable moments, and if we show, we have to show up for those as well as showing up to process sorrow, to process grief, that we have to show up for the joy, that if we look around us and we miss out on the miracle of every day, on the preciousness of the people that are around us. If we're not living in the gratitude of that, again, not solidifying it into a persona, but just being awake, mm. being awake to the blessings that are all around us and the gifts of every day, the gift even of waking up, you know, which some people don't get. Um, the gift of, you know, people after, after Jenna died, I would have people coming, you know, I'd be listening to people talk about, oh, complaining about their kid who just spiked their hair purple and had tongue rings, and, you know, and I, and I would think, my God, mm. are you so oblivious to the gift and the blessing? You have a child who's alive. They may be expressing themselves in ways that scare you and threaten you, but the, are you even aware of the blessings that you have in your life? Or are you going to stay in the complaining of what's not perfect. And so for me, joy is not uh, a big New Year's Eve party coming up. Um, you know, it's 
not manufactured synthetic or institutional joy. It's the simplicity of the moment, the preciousness of the moment, and the people that are around us. And uh, I, I really try to stay conscious and awake to the joy and the gifts of every day. We even have a ritual. We set and I at the end of every day, you know, talk about the moments that, that were just precious in the day. We take inventory. We make sure to take inventory of those things, as well as the things that we'd sooner have left behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I love your idea, Freeman, of, you know, that let's be messy. Let's not stop being ashamed of that. Yeah. You know, we are human, and uh, it's part of our, matter of fact, it's the most trustworthy part of our humanity, especially when I get together with other guys and they're being real. That's That, that for me, is vibrant and alive. Well, and it's interesting, you know, for those of you who are just tuning in, uh, or don't know Ken's backstory, Ken lost his daughter. I want to say she was 21, and she was on a trip to India, Ken, is that correct? Jenna was on a study abroad program. Right, and she was yeah. killed in a, in a bus in accident. at the time. Yeah. And, 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 you know, again, it's these things that season us that make us more real. Um, real in the sense of being able to fully experience it and, and not uh, explain it away and, and, and not, you know, um, I don't know, separate Broken from Broken and whole. Broken and whole. You know? You know, stronger in the broken places. Um, you know, the broken and whole, we're both and. When we try to be either or, we polarize into, hey, Ken, are you destroyed by this? Were you destroyed by your daughter's death? Or have you, you know, are you whole after it? Or, you know, are you better? Those are the wrong questions. Yeah. I'm broken and whole. That's you beautiful. can look into my eyes and see, you know, the sorrow that I will forever have that my daughter didn't get to live out this life. My daughter didn't get to live out her life. But you'll also see the wholeness. Uh, she's gone, and she's right here. Mm. You'll also see that in my eyes. Well, uh, Ken, thank you so much for joining us on Cutting Edge Consciousness. I'm uh, grateful that you're here, and I'm grateful to call you a friend. Uh, what is coming up for you? Um, any... Uh, appearances uh, anywhere in the country? Is there any place? Um, and where you, folks can get a, an, yes, a hold any, of you? Anywhere you know, you'd like to get direct our listeners. My, my website, kendruck.com, www.kendruck.com. Get a hold, any, you know, every connection to me or on Facebook, Dr. Ken Druck, uh, people can get a hold of me there. And there's a full uh, outline of, you know, where I'm going to be. Uh, I hope to uh, shortly be with uh, many of the parents in Connecticut. We're going to be giving a uh, workshop, as we did after Columbine. We gave, I have a workshop called Healing Your Life After the Loss of a Child. Mm. And um, we'll be spending time with the families there. But we also have workshops you know, in California and throughout the country and talks coming up and, uh, and the paperback version of The Real Rules of Life coming up. So it's um, hopefully it will be a blessed year for all of us. Yeah, what a tremendous service you do, and I'm so grateful you took the time to be of service today that to our listening audience. For, well, what um, a joy to be with you guys, and uh, a blessing in my day, and a, and a great way to wind down uh, this year and wind up a, a great new year, hopefully for all of us. Thanks for sharing your space with me. Thank you. Lots of love to you and to Lisette and to our listening audience. Uh, we thank you again for uh, another uh, year together on Cutting Edge Consciousness. We'll be coming uh, we right will back be after coming these messages. back for those of you that are staying. Uh, we'll be coming back for the last uh, installment. And for those that are leaving, we will see you again next year. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness, thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here. With Barnett Bain. Um, it's always a deep a pleasure, a joy, and an honor. I always feel honored when I'm speaking to Ken. There's a soulfulness I love about it. that guy that is uh, so palpable, and he's also so loving and and um, so much fun. Yeah. yeah. And a great dancer. <laughs> and a great dancer. <laughs> the, the powerful story of his experience of deepening after his daughter's death, um, I know we didn't go a ton into that, but it's a powerful story, and, and that he helps other people to 
you know, take the realness of the brokenness of our experience and, and you know, not make sense of it in a tucking in fashion. I love the idea. But broken and broken and whole. Both. It's we're we're yeah. multidimensional. We're, we're, we are complex human beings. And <coughs> well, and this idea that the, the fragmented aspects uh, can be part of what makes us real if we're allowing it to be a little messy. I mean, this is what we were just talking about is that, you know, my tendency to want to look good and to want to have it all together uh, undermines the part of me that doesn't have it all together. And, you know, and, and, and it's okay. It's more than okay. It's important um, to model a kind of uh, self-respect for the unfolding of things, a kind of self-respect for the part of me that, you know, um, that doesn't know or the part of me that's still feeling hurt, you know, mm -hmm. maybe even saying there's a younger part of me that, um, I think the question, the question that we, um, threaded back to periodically on this show is what, who is the me? <laughs> and, and when I uh, push away experiences because yeah. I, uh, I am reluctant to feel them or I'm reluctant to own them or I'm reluctant, um, to admit such and such a thing about me, you know, a shadow piece. I would hate to think that I am, right. you know, um, all of these aspects of myself, uh, n no one of them is me, but they are all me. I love that. And, and broken and whole. From where I am right now, uh, my highest truth, it could change in, the, in 10 minutes from now by the time <laughs> right. I hit the car, but <laughs> what my highest truth is the most expanded uh, relationship with self that I have is, um, is the one that is stringing all these beads together. Yeah. The one that is the container that is holding them all and that is capable, that has the capacity to be in relationship with them all, mm. to um, hear them, to recognize them when they c one or the other comes forward, to have compassion for them, to understand what they've been through, mm and to have uh, a care that is born out of this first-hand relationship with them, having been there. Yeah. Um, but not to get too identified with any particular one that I collapse into it and I think, well, this is all that I am. I, uh, I am this and I am that and I am the next. Th I, am, I am all of it. Yeah, I'm and that's where, that's where this language part of me is very helpful. You know, part of me feels this way or, or there's a part of me that doesn't know what to do with this. Another part of me may be very, you know, ha have some ideas, you know, whatever. Sure, it's there's a young part of me right. who has a worldview that um, cannot cope with the challenges of what it is to be a 59-year-old man. Mm. Finished. <laughs> and when I um, am to so closely identified with, those, with that younger part or a slightly older part or the adolescent part, or the 25-year-old part, he can't uh, cope with the challenges of being a 59-year-old man either. Right, but there is a part of me that can hold them all. The part of me that is holding them all is also not a 59-year-old man. Right. Uh, there is a part of me that is now exploring how I can be in relationship with more and more of those other parts, both positive uh, and some of them, well, they're all positive as long as I feel them. It's mm. when I don't feel an emotion that it goes negative. The, darkest thing felt is, is released and I don't have to let it play out through me over and over again. But there are... Now that, that's important because that's mm -hmm. a gift. So we sharing our, myself, mm -hmm. you know, sharing my experience um, becomes this messy, messy as a gift. You know, tucked in, not so much of a gift, but messy, a little more human, a little more real, a little rougher around the edges, to me, is a gift. Well, it's messy... Yeah, this uh, is a trick you. One. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I want it to be messy. I don't want to use messiness as yeah, a... Yeah, I'm not elevating messy. No, I, I, and I don't think that you are. Yeah. I mean, this is an edge for me. Yeah. Uh, I want to um, be self-respecting. And when I use self-respect, I'm referring to um, respect, to see, to look back at, at all of my emotions so that mm. I am... Um, 
in relationship with all of what is going on with me emotionally from moment to moment um that's self-respect i'm mm. not dishonoring them, denying them the feeling of those doesn't necessarily mean that it is appropriate for me to express them all. Right, right, right. No, that's it. And if yeah. that's what makes me trustworthy, right, is because I'm aware of them, and so they don't automatically have to come out as some passive or less. Okay, I'll be honest, folks. <laughs> they come out less as some sort of passive aggressive behavior in the way that I did with my friend the other day that I spoke about earlier, where that dialogue came out as passive aggression uh, but more and more if I'm aware of what's going on uh, I can have a sense of it as it's coming up feel it and not have to blurt it out not you know uh, I saw this wonderful movie last night called the silver linings playbook in which um, both of these characters have no censor so everything right. that comes in to their minds they have to say right 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 uh, it, which is a beautiful mirror it's a great teacher um, as somebody, as people who are becoming more and more conscious, I am aware of what comes in my mind. Right. Is, uh, I feel it. I experience it. I'm aware of what aspect of me <laughs> is, is generating it. And then I make, I become the strong arms of, of God or the strong arms of the goddess, however you hold it. It's, I am the um, Steward, I am the higher self of that. Bring it to me. <coughs> but don't I'm bring it to right. your community. Don't bring it to your siblings. Don't bring no, that's it right. to your boss. No, I want. So I want to. I want to go. I want to go to this because this is so important. That's the messy piece. Yeah. Well, it's a delicate balance. So again, you know, it's it's there's. Uh, I think we go back to self compassion. We go back a little bit to the capacity to hold these aspects in a gentle and generous way mm -hmm. so we allow them to be part of our experience but not dominate our experience. And there is a level of discernment that I can self-regulate and I can sort of choose when to express something and, and how to express it in a way so it's, it's, it's um, oh, it's, it, it allows people to be a witness to it but I'm not making them responsible for it. Does that make sense? Yes, and I'm not making them, uh, I'm not exposing them uninvited right. to um, things to, you know, it's, there, are, there, are, there are ratios of this. Some of it, some of it is um, obviously inappropriate, you know, yeah. some of it for me to act out and feel my feelings and then to have a tantrum um, <laughs> in the aisle of the grocery store because I'm feeling it. Right. Um, it is messy and I am intimate enough with that small young part of myself who's having the meltdown to say bring it to me mm. have the meltdown either later at home or you want to have it now quietly uh, in my personal inner world we'll have it or if you want to go outside in the backyard later we'll have it even together yeah uh, you and I, I may even join you but it'll be um, it'll be in a place that is uh, that is um, comfortable and that is suitable and appropriate for me because I am the um, I am the seat of consciousness right now. Yeah, no, that's right. That's exactly right. The ability to really create the outlets, constructive expression for the part of us that's showing up versus whether it's messy or ver it's yeah, versus or it's not messy versus this over reverence for being honest and open all the time. That doesn't work. I mean, there's not a uh, there's a way of doing it, uh, again, taking care of the selves, the many me's, um, that, that need healthy outlets. I need... I knew somebody who, who you know, we had a similar dis discussion, and, um, and she went off and um, mouthed off to her boss and got fired. Was it her intention to get uh, fired? Well, probably it was, <laughs> but she didn't think it was. Right. Uh, she, she was thought, just being honest, right? She thought right? she was being, <laughs> honest, being honest. Right? She thought she was talking about something called radical honesty, which, you know, there we desire blacks and whites. Yeah. We desire the world to be tucked in. Yeah. Um, that, that is not messy, living with messiness. That is living with absolutes uh, and guarantees. 
Um, I'm going to be radically honest, so I'm going to tell my boss what I'm going <laughs> to think, what I think of him. And Whoopsie daisy. That is not being messy. No. That is reducing. That's reckless. That is re- reckless, and it is reducing, calling something messy, but reducing it to absolutes and guarantees. I have to honor my inner self, and so I'm going to pl- throw a custard pie. Yeah, no, we've all, and, 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 and that's not what we're, we're That's not what we're ad- saying at all. Advocating. You know, we're, we got to wrap it up, but, you know, it's it's so good that we, we it, <laughs> in the wrap it up, up. Let's let's demonstrate this. So we're not going to wrap all this. We're up. not going to wrap anything up. We're just going to end, folks. <laughs> Today we're just going to say goodbye to you, and you have to tune in uh, because this is clearly something that's <clears throat> playing out and working out in real time. Barnett and I are both committed to going to our edge. This show is the edge. Uh, the and, and it is the edge of the shows for this year, by the way. So I would I invite you to speak a little bit about that. This is the last show of the year. Well, there's and there's uh, what well, depends because people might be listening to this after the first of the year. So whenever you're hearing this, uh, it's right for you. It's right for <laughs> you. And we invite you to keep tuning in because we've got an amazing collection of folks joining us. And uh, so just keep coming back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Thanks for listening. Bye now.